He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the fowler's snare, from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrows that fly by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the Most High your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you. No disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You'll tread upon the lion and the cobra. You'll trample the lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honour him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. <laughs> Have you ever considered just how safe we really are under the wings of God? Of course, it's not about a physical safety, we understand. It's a spiritual safety. Too many people don't give any regard to their spiritual safety, but we, God's people, have to. And that has to be a main focus for us, and that has to be the message that we pass on to everyone that we meet, that in your spirit, that real you underneath this flesh exterior actually can be safe. How many people have you met who are lonely, who are despairing in some, some way, who've had a bad experience, maybe lost someone? It could be anything. It could be illness. It could be debt. It could be anything. But people's lives are not at peace and yet God says, you can be safe. We're talking here of the reality of salvation, not just the, the feel-good factor, but the experience of knowing and trusting God so that we are, we're not consumed. It's about living for him so that we're not consumed by the things of everyday life because they will come to us. We can't avoid life. We can't avoid experience. We can't avoid disaster. We can't avoid the helplessness that faces us day by day. And if you've been watching the TV reports in the Nepal situation, just like anywhere when there's a national disaster, it's just awful to see people totally bereft. You know, in chapter 1 of Ruth, God's hand was hard upon this lady Naomi, wasn't it? And her family. There was a famine in Judah. A move to Moab, the death of her husband, the marriage of her two sons to foreign wives, then a death of her sons, and it seemed to be one blow after another, which causes Naomi to, Naomi to feel so sorry for herself. And you remember that point when she's saying to the girls, go back to your families. Okay, she wanted to go back. She'd lost her perspective completely. And she said, it's more bitter for me than for you because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. And you remember when they arrived back in Bethlehem and there's an incredible stir. And she says, don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Okay, thank you. Um, she said, call me Mara because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. What we can actually see in that picture is that she's almost at a wit's end. She's lost sight of the promises of God and she's just looking for a corner to hide in, really. Although she's using all these mechanisms to cover up. The fact is, she's at the point where she doesn't really want to see God's plans anymore. She can't believe that after all that's happening, and that has happened, that God actually would be interested in her. Now, she knows there's a God. She knows he's almighty, she knows he rules, and he has, he's in the affairs of, of humanity on every single level. And she knows that in her disobedience, God has allowed her to go through difficult times, taking her to almost breaking point. But Naomi has forgotten her history. And that's essential for the identity of the nation. It's essential for us that we understand who we are in God's economy. We have to understand that we are a people of promise. She'd forgotten the story of Joseph that we mentioned last week. She'd forgotten the wilderness story, the time when Moses took the people out of Egypt. 
And with the picture of God meeting with his people time and again, rescuing them, feeding them, judging them, showing them mercy. And this whole picture that she, Naomi, as a Jew, should be looking at, it's a whole picture. And it's there. The scriptures are there so that the people of God can know at any time, regardless of our situation, regardless of our sin, that there is grace to be had. And that is the undeserved goodness and favour of God that he lavishes on his children because he loves us, because he loves us, because he loves us. And we have to be constantly reminded of that because we constantly fail. We can't help ourselves. We are actually, as I said the other week, we're quite accomplished sinners, all of us really, aren't we? You know the story of the old Scots lady, lovely Christian lady, was dying. And a minister went to see and just check out her faith just before she died. And he said, Janet, what would you say if after all that he has done for you, God should let you perish? She said, you know, he can do as he likes. But if he does, he'll lose more than I do. Because I might lose my soul, but he would lose his honour, because his word can never be broken. This is where we should be spiritually, isn't it? Not simply knowing the words, but knowing Jesus as our saviour. It's a relationship that's personal and practical and expresses itself in the way that we are, not just by the things that we do and say. Now, Naomi's story is not, is not just bitterness at the beginning of the story. God lifts the famine, opens the way home for her, and he's, he's given her a devoted daughter-in-law, and this girl, Ruth. She commits herself to, her, to the point of death, and that is grace, we decided. Where you go, I go. Where you die, I die. Your God will be my God. And at this point, we have to actually marvel at the tapestry of God's plans, the way that he brings about his purposes. And it's interesting, isn't it, how he involves not just the odd individual, but sometimes scores of people so that the blessing of his, uh, his blessing lives on and on and on and on. Was it St. Paul say to the Romans, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who live according to his purposes. Do you know, I can remember a friend of mine was in a nasty car accident, a car had gone under a lorry, and it smashed him up, and his face was, <coughs> was floating. Um, basically, every bone in his face was broken. And he could just make the noise like this. He was all wired up. And I remember going to see him and sitting by his bed late at night and all the machines going off. And, he, and I said, he says, who's there? I said, it's Bob Greer. How are you doing? And he says, all things work together for good to those who love God. And he actually recited that, that. And actually, that was the man who came to my induction and prayed. This is a perspective. You see, in this case here, in the life of this destitute family, God brings about a blessing that will change history and affect every person that ever lived. Now, how, how incredible is that? You know, isn't it great when we reflect on, the, on an event or a time where God has worked out and how he's worked and all the surprises that have been there? Do you, you know I think it's great when I go around pastoral visit and people tell me about things that have happened in their lives. And then they kind of say, oh, and don't forget such and says, oh, yeah, and you never guess what happened there. And it's this excitement, this wholesomeness of this experience of God. God is involved here. God has got a plan. And actually, the ripples that go on and on and on beyond anything we can think or imagine. Now, we finished last time, didn't we, with Naomi's words. I went away full, she said, but the Lord has brought me back empty. And that is not true. Because Naomi was so tired with the darkness, the difficult times and the pain that she couldn't see the light that God had provided. And then it rolls on into <coughs> chapter 2. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side from the clan of Elimelech, a man, man of standing whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone else in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. And so she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they called back. Boaz asked the foreman of his harvesters, who's that young woman? 
The foreman replied, she's the Moabitess who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She went into the field and has worked steadily from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. I've told them, told the men not to touch you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the men have filled. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, Why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. How you left your, your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people who you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Here we meet Boaz. And also we see something of the character of Ruth coming through. And we sense the presence of God. I don't know if you see it, but I sense the presence of God behind the scenes, ever present, but never forced in his way. Boaz, we learn, is a relative of, Lim of Elimelech. You know, Naomi's saying you've got, she's got no one. Hey, up. He's a relative of Naomi's husband. And at this point, we can see the things are really not as bad as Naomi had betrayed them. And this is a strange type of defense ne mechanism that many pessimists seem to employ. Always think that things, the worst things, and then they might get better, but they're not likely to. But how can there be any room for pessimism in the kingdom of God? You know, I find it particularly frustrating when I meet Christians who moan and groan all the time and would say that their glass is half empty rather than say it's half full. It's a bit like that, that old man, you know, who was always whinging. And someone says, so how are you doing today, Huey? And he says, oh, you never know, my, my health's not any better, you know. Oh, why is that then? Well, do you know, there was a time I could walk all the way around the block in the morning. Now, he says, I'll get halfway around and I get that tired, I have to turn around and go back again. <laughs> what a piece of nonsense but that's how we are sometimes aren't we for Naomi you see the tactic seems to have worked after the picture of desolation that we saw in chapter 1 you know Jean-Paul Sartre who's the um, French philosopher who said you will never find peace and happiness until you're ready to commit yourself to something worth dying for and wasn't it D.L. Moody, the American evangelist, who says, I'm only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And that which I can do by the grace of God, I will do. So if you want a heading for this today, and there's only one heading today, it's the start of a beautiful friendship. I'm not normally given to reading love stories, but this is really lovely, isn't it? Now, for the first time reading this story for the first time, Boaz is a bit like the sunshine breaking through the cloud that's been hanging over Naomi's family for such a long time. And it's as if a com there's a complete swing of the pendulum, pendulum and the situation seems to just get better and better and better. Look at verse 3, for example. He says, uh, verse 3. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she found herself working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. It shows us, actually, that he was a man of means. And then in verse 4, we can see that he's also a man of God. Look at the way he greets his workers. And just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you, he says. The Lord bless you, they called back. Now, there's a very important lesson here, actually. If we want to know the relationship that a person has with God, don't just look at their persona and their public side. Look at the details of their everyday life. Boaz's attitude actually proves that his greeting wasn't just there to impress, but it was a revelation of the man of God that he is. And one writer actually puts it um, that he was a man saturated with God. Now, I like, I like that, but I don't want to get too poetic or romantic here. We also see something of the character of Ruth, which is actually very important as we progress through the chapter. First of all, we see she was the girl of initiative, and she was willing to care for Naomi. 
And Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. There was no instruction there, she just took the initiative. She understood she had to care for this old lady. The old lady probably couldn't do much herself, so she had to do something. Secondly, there's Ruth's humility. Notice the way that she uses her initiative gently and without presumption, and she works away quietly. Now, if you go to verse 6, look at it. The foreman is talking to Boaz, and he says, he said, who's that then? He said, oh, she's the Moabitess who came back with um, Naomi. She actually asked, can she please glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters? She went into the field and worked steadily from morning till now, and she's only had a short rest in the shelter. She's a bit of a worker, that one. She's worth looking, you know, worth keeping an eye on. All she asks for, actually, is the leftovers, and she's happy with that. Now, I don't know, did you, as you read that, do you see a, a New Testament parallel at all, anyone? Matthew's Gospel, anyone see it? The Syrian Phoenician woman who came to Jesus and knelt before him, Lord, help me, she said. He replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs, the foreigner. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted, and, your do and her daughter was healed from that very hour. You see, the initiative and humility, there's a pattern coming on here, isn't there? But also, thirdly, Ruth is a worker. There's no pretense about her. We know she worked all day. We know she collected grain fresh and, it carried, and carried it home to Naomi. There's no slacking. She, she has a target to work towards, and honourably she does just that. Is it any wonder that Boaz and the other workers are actually quite impressed with her? I want you to know something else as well. God is really involved here. There's no such thing as disappointment. There's only his appointments. And there's no such thing as coincidence, but only his plans and his opportunities. Interesting, if we look at verse 2 again, Lot says, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out and began to glean in the fields behind the harvesters. As it turned out, okay, she found herself working the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. And just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. I want you to note those two phrases, as it turned out just then. But notice too that God never forces the issue, He merely provides the scene. He gives us opportunities constantly. He wants us to use our sanctified common sense. He wants us to take the initiative. He wants us to understand that the opportunities are great. And that could be in any area. That could be in personal relationships. That could be an outreach. It could be anything. God provides the scene. We have to act upon it. Too many people sit back and say, well, I'll wait for God to tell me to do it. But just go and do it. And clearly impressed with Ruth's attitude and behaviour, Boaz welcomes her and invites her to stay in his field. There's the gift of hospitality. Do you remember Leviticus 19 we talked about last week? When an alien lives with you in your land, do not mistreat him. The alien living among you must be treated as one of your own native born. Love him as yourself. And then he assures her safety, provides for her needs, by way of water, and as a quiet word with his men to make grain available, available without embarrassing her, also to keep their hands off her. So she's got security all the way around, isn't she? Do you see the wings? So Boaz said to Ruth, my daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with my servant girls. And watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the girls. And I've told the men not to touch you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars. But all of this was for good reason. Because, you know, we saw in chapter 1 that there had been a stir when these two ladies had returned from Bethlehem. And, it's a lo and what's lovely about the situation as we read it here is that Ruth didn't in any way promote herself. Her focus was really just on caring for her mother-in-law. And the results of her, of her work, of her behaviour, she worked quietly in the background, was that folk were actually challenged by her sacrifice and her commitment, and they were encouraged by that. At this she bowed down with her face to the ground. She exclaimed, why, would you, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? And then Boaz says it, and you can see the confirmation of what I've just said. I've been told about what you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband. 
How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with the people you didn't know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. He understood about the Ark of the Covenant. He understood that under the wings of the cherubim we are safe. That our soul is in the palm of his hand. He understood what it meant to trust God. He understood what it meant for people to have a sense of security in their heart and a peace. See, her faith had impacted more than just a few folk, but her bearing was such that apparently it was obvious she was a woman of faith who knew the peace of God herself. You know, stories told of Oliver Cromwell's secretary in the 17th century was sent to Europe. And he was sent on a diplomatic mission. Um, and as was the custom, his servant went with him and had to sleep in the same room. And on the trip, <clears throat> the guy just couldn't sleep. He was really worried about what was going on. And he woke the servant up and said, I can't sleep. <laughs> you just love people like that. <clears throat> and he said, my Lord, he said, can I just ask you a couple of questions? He said, yeah, of course you can. He said, did God rule the world before we were born? Yes, he did. And does he rule it now? Yes. And will he rule it after we die? Yes, he will. He said, well, why don't we just let him get on with it? Good idea. And they went back to sleep and a pair of them slept soundly. You see, this quiet confidence in God is something that Ruth is displaying in her life as well. Humility seems to shine through her, particularly when we consider her response to his kindness in chapter 10, in verse 10. She understood that she was the foreigner and that folk would be suspicious of her. I know it wouldn't just appeal to a glowing picture of Ruth, but what I'm saying is her example is there, isn't it? She doesn't expect special treatment. If she had, she had been looking for another job. What she was doing was menial, back-breaking work. The men would go in a line along a field. They would gather a bunch of, of, of um, wheat or whatever it was, a barley, and then they would cut it. It would then be taken and tied, okay, behind, and then they would move on. It would then be taken and loaded into a transport, maybe a cart of some kind, pulled by a donkey or a camel or whatever it was, and that would be taken to the threshing floor. Then the grain would be separated with a winnowing fork, and that would be separated up, and they would take out the chaff, and they would keep the wheat, okay? Following on from those people who were loading were the cleaners, and they would come up and pick anything that had been dropped, and behind them came people like Ruth, who were extremely poor, but willing to accept anything that they could find. But she's so different, isn't she, from folk, and these people are different from folk today, who insist on their rights rather than getting their head down and going to work. Who want all the benefits but offer no commitment. And before I sound too much like a politician there, let me just be clear that these principles apply to everyone regardless of their economic policy because there is no such thing as a free lunch. And the application in and around the Christian church is so obvious here, isn't it? Too many people <clears throat> are sitting Sunday by Sunday enjoying the blessing of worship in all its parts but they do absolutely nothing. You know, I will remember a man in one of the churches we were in. He'd been there for upwards of 40 years and he successfully avoided every kind of service and when he got to his 70th birthday he announced to the church that it was now for time for the younger ones to take over <laughs> <coughs> he'd had done absolutely nothing with his one year's experience that he'd lived 40 times over and he was kidding himself on that just by being there he was actually contributing to the well-being of the fellowship and the extension of god's kingdoms and he thought that that actually gave him grandfather rights in the church and that meant he could have a say over the decisions that were made for the church by the congregation, but he would never attend a church meeting either. How many times have we seen this? What kind of teaching is it that encourages Christians to believe that they have some kind of diplomatic immunity, both inside and outside of the church, which means that they don't have to take responsibility for their words or their actions? See, Ruth's question to Boaz in regard to his kindness to her brings about a response, but it doesn't actually bring a direct answer. He didn't say to her, well, actually, it's kind of me to help you, isn't it? 
but actually it's the least I could do. After all, you brought your Naomi home and you're caring for her. He wasn't helping her as some kind of reward. He didn't feel sorry for her. And he didn't feel obligated in some way to, to help her out. What Boaz recognised in Ruth as she would actually given herself to go behind the Galenas, he recognised a strength of character as something that was inspired by her faith in God and her love for her mother-in-law who had actually taught her very well. And here again we see a picture of grace. This un unconditional giving was met with unconditional giving. You see, the implications of what Ruth had done by leaving her home country, her gods and her people, and then committing herself to this old woman who apparently had nothing except the God of her ancestors, who she recognised as sovereign, were actually quite incredible. Ruth has done more than most folk would have done in her position. And what she did, she responded by faith. And Boaz, as a believer, is God's channel of blessing to her. In his words, he confers on her the promise of God. Look at verse 12. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May, may you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to find rescue and refuge. Know the peace of God that passes all understanding, Ruth. That peace that guards your heart and your mind. And dwell in the inner sanctuary beneath the wings of the cherubim, the place where God is. And know his protection and his guiding hand. Because life is hard. But that is real life. Being more than a conqueror is when you know that peace, even when the battle rages around you. See, Ruth wasn't an employee of God, and she wasn't an employee of Boaz. The recognition here is that she trusted God and that he's given her the ability and the liberty to love Naomi and to become one of his people depending only on his grace. You know, when a person works eight hours a day and receives a fair day's pay for his times, that is a wage. When someone competes with an opponent and receives a trophy for their performance, that's a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for their long service or high achievement, that is an award. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize and deserves no award and yet receives a gift anyway, that's a really good picture of God's unmerited favour. And that's exactly what we mean when we talk about the grace of God. And we continue next week. Let's pray, shall we? we thank you Lord for the opportunity to get a glimpse into real life as it was way back when but we recognise that these stories tell us a story of life as it is with us today we understand that there are times when we fall into that trap of just being there and projecting a persona that doesn't have any link with reality so we pray that you grant us an integrity to learn to trust you to understand that we are safe in your hands and that we can be so much more than we are if only we would just trust you that bit more rescue us from being people who savor that one year's experience at the expense of all the other years and help us to be effective for you but we ask it in Jesus' lovely name and for his glory alone. Amen. Amen. Amen.